Okay, there we go. Hello everyone. How's it going team here? And this is BXGS weekly episode 14 Hey man tag welcome to the stream. Yes, my migraine is way better today. Thank you very much <laughs> um, Apologies for the delay. I could not stream yesterday because I was basically half dead So uh, we are gonna be doing this today sort of a random schedule, but you know if you're watching this on Twitch, well, thank you very much for joining. If you're watching this on YouTube, as usual, I guess it doesn't matter that much to you when I exactly I stream it. So, you know, let's get started. Um, as I said, we have episode 14. As usual, you can find all the links and everything that has been mentioned on GitHub. Uh, there should be a link to the GitHub in the channel description on Twitch. And if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, the link to the exact file is in the description of the video. Let's get started. We do have quite a lot of uh, things to talk about today. Uh, so the first thing is the big news of the week. You probably already heard about it more than one time. It is the GitHub acquisition by Microsoft. And uh, yeah, it is, you know, um, quite sudden. So nobody, I think, expected it. It happened in literally like two days. The first was the leak that Microsoft is in talks to the GitHub and then immediately that the GitHub was acquired, I think the next day, basically. Um, a lot of discussions around that, a lot of people are unhappy about it and trying to figure out, you know, where to move, going to GitLab and so on and so forth. But um, I don't know, in my opinion, it's actually a good thing. So it's like GitHub was not really profitable and they were burning through money quite significantly in the past years. So it, unless they sold to someone, I think they would have closed at some point. So I, I'm, I'm actually viewing the Microsoft acquisition as a good thing. Not just because, you know, now they have money, but also because Microsoft have actually been contributing to open source quite heavily in the past year. So after the uh, Satya Nadella became the CEO, he uh, changed the company, the way the company works completely, right? And we have, because of all the open source work, we have VS Code, we have uh, TypeScript, we have, like, there's a ton of amazing tools. And... I think I remember reading that Microsoft is actually number one uh, contributor on GitHub, like across the companies, which is pretty crazy, actually. Yeah. Um, what do I think of VS Code? VS Code is my favorite JavaScript editor. This is like the my editor of choice. This is what I use on a daily basis. And, you know, this is like, I think it's the best one out there. Um, I like it way more than Atom. Um, the interesting question, by the way, on the GitHub acquisition is what happens to Atom now? So I'm sure the Microsoft will continue supporting Electron because they use it for VS Code, but VS Code and Atom are kind of competing things, right? So I'm kind of curious how that will work out. Will they like keep releasing two of them? Will they merge the teams and just, you know, extend the VS Code to do everything that Atom does now? It's gonna be very interesting to see how that develops. This is like one of those aspects that are, you know, uncertain basically at this point. But okay, yeah, really, really interesting to see how all of this will end up. Let us continue. Uh, next article we have is a tale of Re React server-side rendering. This is essentially a story or I guess the description of how I, I showed off this website, I think a couple of um, podcasts before, what the? Is it down? DNS Pro Domain, fi uh, okay. Not sure what's up with it, but this website was on one of the previous podcasts, awesometalks.party. Um, um, is it my DNS? Yeah, maybe it might be my, my DNS from my provider or has been janky in the past days. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe I should switch to the Google DNS or uh, Cloudflare or whatever. Uh, so yeah, it's a very nice website that has a collection of talks uh, categorized and everything and like search it by speakers, by categories and so on and so forth. And the article is a story from the author of that website uh, who talks about using server-side rendering to make it faster, right? So how do you put it all together with the React Router, React Helmet, Style Components, Apollo and all that kind of stuff? So if you were interested in a practical uh, sort of walkthrough through the server-side rendering for a relatively complex website, then do have a look at this article. It does go pretty in-depth on all that stuff. Right, continuing, we got what is this in JavaScript? Um, I think this is a topic that pops up quite frequently in our Discord server. There is a lot of people who are um, confused by this and pun non-intended, uh, but you know, this is a pretty, it's like, 
<laughs> it's a bit hard to talk about this concept because, you know, the keyword this in JavaScript is one of the key things that, um, the, like the prototypical inheritance in general, right? That you have to understand to write clean and uh, working JavaScript, actually. So let me just permit stuff. I feel like there's something blocked here. Um, so this, this article talks quite in depth. So as you can see here, it's pretty long about what is this, how it works, and what does it typically address? You know, global scopes, local scopes, functions, objects, prototypes, and all that kind of stuff. So if you still don't understand this completely, uh, you should if you want to program, you know, a proper JavaScript, let's, or not a proper, it's a wrong word. If you want to use JavaScript to 100%, right? Because it's a quite important concept, actually. So this article can give you a pretty good in-depth introduction to that. Uh, if you want a refresher, there's also a pretty good one. They do talk about the data bindings or like the context bindings and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it is really, really good in-depth article on this in JavaScript. All right, um, continuing, we got before you bury yourself in packages, learn Node.js runtime itself. Title is pretty self-explanatory. I wholeheartedly agree with the notion that, you know, before actually trying to figure out uh, what NPM library to use, you should have a look at the Node core and try to figure out if there's already a solution for this. And um, essentially the author here goes to say, you know, here's, here's the problems that you might have, is the challenges with a Node, right? And here's how you can tackle them, right? So you'd like learn the JavaScript itself, understand non-blocking nature and so on and so forth. So there's some specific pointers here. God damn it, those, I'm not sure if you heard that, but we have a lot of motorcycle riders recently and those guys are loud, so apologies in advance if you hear any of that. I tried to tweak the microphone a bit, but uh, yeah, they are sometimes obnoxiously loud. But yeah, uh, returning to the article. So there's some pointers on how you can tackle um, learning the Node core, but you know, basically I would recommend going to nodejs.org and going to the documentation section and just reading, reading the docs, right? The documentation for Node, in my opinion, is really good. Um, where's the docs for the latest version actually? Nine, where's the 10? Oh, is it this one? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so the docs are really good in my opinion, and they cover basically everything you need to know. And if you just one take like one day, or I don't know, maybe maybe even less than one day. I don't know how long you need to actually read all of that because I kind of did it, you know, step by step. But if you just take some time to actually learn the top level concepts here, that will save you a lot of time and a lot of additional libraries that you actually don't need better than cats howling. Um, I mean, I do have three cats at home. They don't really howl, but <laughs> they can be loud as well. <laughs> but I can agree that yes, there's definitely better than cats howling um, under the windows for 24 <laughs> seven. Okay, continuing we got Oh, yeah, this is a really cool one side channel attacking browsers through CSS three features. So this is not quite JavaScript, but still, you know, kind of browser related thing. Um, so the guys figured out the CSS3 attack that yeah uses side channel vulnerability and allows you to do some crazy things and the Chrome and Firefox are both vulnerable. So if you are interested in security, it is a very large article and it goes very in depth on how exactly it works. You know, the whole like CSS engine and, and all of that. So you can see like there's like even RGB references that pixel uh, processing and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty crazy when you like uh, read through it. But if you are interested in seeing what kind of um, attack vectors can be used to compromise your browser, definitely have a look at this because this is just fascinating. It's like it's, it uses CSS blend modes and WebGL shaders or I guess GL shaders to actually do the thing, right? So it's, it's like, <laughs> It is insane. I think it's, yeah, it's, it seems to be already fixed in, in latest Chrome and Firefox. So it's been actually discovered quite some time ago, but uh, yeah, it's inter like, it's a very interesting write up on it. So if you're interested in security and just generally interested in, in you know, what kind of crazy things you can do to the browser and CSS, do have a look at that. All right, continuing, we got, uh, oh yeah, this is kind of a flamey article, I guess. It's called web code is a solved problem. How about fixing web UI next? 
And uh, what the author essentially talks about is that, hey, you know, we now have all this amazing additions in the JavaScript land, like WebAssembly, like uh, tons of really cool frameworks, like, yeah, I don't know, like a lot of really cool things, you know, in JavaScript ES 2016 and, and later on cool features, pattern matching, all the crazy stuff. But we still don't have um, anything good for UIs, you know, we're still stuck with HTML, CSS and DOM that are in the author's opinion are subpar experience, right? So HTML5 was released like 10 years ago and it's still not very good and there's not, not been too many things added to it. And you can either agree or not with the author. So in my opinion, it's not as bad as he makes it sound. While yeah, this is true, the HTML and uh, CSS are way more stagnant than JavaScript in comparison. And I think the main reason here is because JavaScript is driven not just by the browsers, but also by the Node.js now. Um, while HTML, CSS and DOM is something that is browser specific. So, you know, it's like, way harder to actually do anything to it. There's also another point that I think a lot of people forget the main rule of the TC39 and other committees that work with uh, web technologies that don't break the web, right? You cannot drastically change something that will impact all the old existing code. So this is why it's so hard to actually change DOM, change CSS. You cannot just throw away all the old stuff, right? You have to make it backward compatible which brings a lot of challenges along. But we do have progress. We have Flexbox, we have CSS Grid, um, although I think it's still not completely supported in all the browsers, which is a bit weird, but we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, there's also a really cool link here, which I did not know uh, before. Uh, it's a website, whatwebcando.today, and you can actually see all the features that are available on the web and features that are available. Uh, let me try that again. Features that are available in your browser, Obviously, some of them will not be available on desktops, like, you know, SMS access and geofencing and proximity sensors, because my desktop doesn't really have them. But um, wake lock as well as something. Although, you know, you could probably have that in a browser, like you do have like sleep, um, the screensaver, right? So that should be working. I'm not sure why not, maybe not yet implemented. But it's really cool to see how much you can actually do purely with your browser. And I think we've did come a long way from like 10 years ago. And we're going to talk about that at the very end of the live stream. But uh, I don't think it's just as bad as the author claims. Also, there's still, you know, this the article that makes you think about, you know, what can we actually improve? What can we make better? What can we change in the web to make it easier to build UIs? Like UI frameworks are kind of, you know, a game changer. They are a game changer. And web components are also even though they're getting there very slowly, they are, I think they're gonna have a profound impact once they are sort of at version 2.0 or something, because I mean, Polymer is still a bit of a pain in the ass to use, to be honest, but um, all the things underlying web components like Shadow DOM and uh, all that stuff is kind of really fascinating. Yeah, one of the problems is the web component support, which is still kind of wonky to say the least. Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's getting there, but yeah, we're gonna see how that develops. But anyway, you know, it's it's there are definitely interesting thoughts in this article, and it's definitely I mean, it's supposed to be provocative, right? It's supposed to be flamey because it needs to sort of ignite the spark so that people start discussing it and start figuring out, you know, how can we fix it? How what, what can we do? How can we move the UI forward? So it's it's an interesting read. It is quite lengthy, but uh, yeah. Right, continuing, we got uh, building a Facebook Messenger chatbot with Node.js. Um, exactly what you would expect. This is a tutorial, pretty lengthy one, as you can see here, on how you can build a Facebook Messenger chatbot using Node.js, um, using Express to be specific. I mean, it seems to be very, uh, quite simple. So the Facebook chatbot seems to be working with webhooks. So this is exactly what you're gonna be using. You're gonna be handling the webhook and then just reacting to it and sending the messages back to Facebook, right? So it's, um, I mean, it's relatively straightforward, but if you never did anything like this, it's a pretty good tutorial that will get you started and help you create a um, cats and dogs bot. So yeah, right, continuing, we got another article from the Mozilla guys. Uh, it's called Overscripted, digging into JavaScript execution at scale. 
It is a lengthy-ish uh, article that, yeah, essentially talks about JavaScript execution at scale. Um, it's interesting. So they use the, uh, it's, it, it's um, how do you put it correctly? It's an exploratory or I guess research article that goes into the um, Alexa top uh, 10,000 site list, right? It crawls them with a depth one and then does some analytics on top of that. I will not go through all of that. So because there is some like interesting things in it, but uh, um, like I would encourage you to read on your own because as they even explore like crypto jacking, which has became apparently quite widespread today. It's like 0.16% were crypto jacked. It's, it's just like out of, uh, what was it? 10,000 top websites. It's insane when you think about it. So once again, importance of having a proper script blocker and ad blocker that actually block that crap out of your web pages and, you know, do not load your processor uh, unnecessarily. But uh, yeah, so it's pretty cool. And they also have this um, Mozilla data analysis challenge if you want to try yourself and do some data analytics on it. Um, knock yourself out. Uh, but yeah, highly recommended reads. There are some very interesting uh, insights into the current web. Right, continuing, we got, um, yes, I compiled a million TypeScript files in under 40 seconds, this is how. Um, again, self-explanatory uh, title. Um, the author here took the GitHub, um, what's the name of it, wait a second, GitHub, yeah, GitHub BigQuery uh, data. So if you didn't know that GitHub provides the BigQuery data set that you can uh, just have a look at and query it using the Google uh, BigQuery platform which is actually pretty neat. So like if you never used it, it is essentially um, a very, very, very big database that allows you to do pretty complex queries in milliseconds, which, you know, it's pretty impressive. So if you never played with it, do try. They have a pretty nice web UI. Um, so he queried the GitHub, he got the TypeScript files and then, uh, yeah, executed them. <laughs> Run into TypeScript inside BigQuery. So this is like, this is basically all you have to know, which is, it's, it's like insane to me that you can even do this. So like li you literally, you know, you do this, like it, it, so Google built a database that can run JavaScript within it and you can run TypeScript compilation within it to compile TypeScript directly in the database. <laughs> it is just crazy. But it works and it's a very neat experiment in, you know, trying that. So yeah, you actually have um, <laughs> TypeScript execution there in a million files. And it took like, yeah, what was it? 100 seconds? I, I don't know. What, what was the, the, the time? I forgot already. 40 seconds. So all the props to BigQuery guys, amazing work here. And uh, props to Uri Shaked. I hope I pronounced his name correctly to trying this crazy approach and making actually uh, verifying that it actually works, which is, you know, it's just mind boggling if you think about it for a second. All right, next thing we got is um, keeping Node.js fast, tools, techniques, and tips for making high performance Node servers. Exactly what, you, what you would think about, essentially a survey of tools, approaches, and things that you can use to keep your um, Node.js server fast insights into how you can profile things, how you can use things like AutoCanon to do high load testing, how you can diagnose the problems uh, using a bunch of tools like the uh, Clinic Doctor, for example. Some interesting tools that I never uh, heard about before. I think, again, my JavaScript is blocked and some of the things are, yeah, there we go. Some of the things are not rendered correctly, but there we go. Should be way better now. So there are some of the tools that are quite obscure or not obscure, I guess, more area specific that I never worked with and never heard about. So it is definitely, you know, if you are optimizing your server for a specific area like memory or CPU performance, this is a really good uh, article to have a look at because they do look at the very different areas and very different things that you can do to optimize your code and to make it RAM efficient, CPU efficient, request efficient, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so yeah, pretty good one. All right, continuing, we got uh, how I automated my job with Node.js. Uh, it's a, essentially a life story about the person working in a game development industry and doing uh, reskin games, right? So the reskins, if you're not familiar with the definition, is essentially making 
more or less the same game with a different uh, design and maybe some slightly different mechanics, right? So what you usually do is you create a template and then out of that template you create uh, different games with just replacing the assets, right? So the author went ahead and used the Jira as a basis and written a command line interface using Node.js with a commander um, package to automate the whole templating thing. When you just, you know, run the command and ask you a bunch of questions or I don't think, yeah, it looks like it didn't even ask any questions. You use Jira tickets to create a template that is required for the game, which is pretty fascinating. So there's some uh, interesting things here. So if you were interested uh, in sort of temp uh, templates for projects, maybe this is something you need to do to have a look at this. There are some interesting pointers in it. Right, continuing, we got feature flags and Node.js and React. Um, this article is an overview of um, possible approaches to feature toggling or, you know, using feature flags, feature switches, whatever you call them. Um, feature flags can be immensely useful, but be careful while adding them because they add a lot of complexity to your apps. But if you need them nonetheless, like, for example, for A-B testing, if you're at, you know, large late state of commercial projects that want to figure out which approach is better. There's no way around them. You need them. And that's basically an overview of tools that you can use. Uh, starting from launch darkly paid service that I think is like one of the most popular ones in a node community, at least, and going down to like flip it, F flip and unleash that are libraries uh, for JavaScript. Um, yeah, so it's essentially an overview and, you know, with some code samples and um, show off how to exactly use it. So if you're looking for uh, feature flags and Node.js, do have a look at this. Seems to be pretty, I'm not sure how comprehensive it is, but uh, I don't think there's that many libraries that allow you doing this. So unless you roll your own, which is always, uh, you know, a re risky thing to do, at least time consuming thing to do, do have a look at this one. All right, continuing, we got a new JavaScript proposal. Yes, or ECMAScript proposal, if you would, as patterns for matching and destruction. Uh, so, you know, we had matching and destruction before, right? And uh, now there's a proposal to use as, so you can actually rename the variables essentially in a nicer way, right? Um, it looks nice. So I'm like, I'm not sure how much I would use that or at least something like this. I mean, maybe that would be very useful in terms of uh, pattern matching, actually. That's, that's something that I haven't thought about yet. Within the typical destruction, I, I mean, I guess it's okay. Um, but I'm like, I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure how useful I would see it within the normal destruction. But yeah, in pattern matching, that definitely looks like a pretty nifty feature. Right, continuing, we got, uh, yes, speaking about pattern matching, it's just been moved to stage one, which is great to see. I don't remember if I already did that or not. I probably should have checked my old reports, but uh, it is now at stage one. And this is one of the proposals that I'm really, really excited about. Uh, speaking about proposals, TC39 uh, is making their work more transparent and approachable for community, which is really cool. So they've made this tc39.github.io slash beta website that basically lists all the proposals under different stages for whatever reason, there's only stage three right now here. Um, maybe it just doesn't load them all. I wonder if that's, uh, again, my JavaScript blocking. No, it doesn't seem so, um, which is a bit weird, but I guess, you know, it is the upcoming agenda. So yeah, essentially it's a website that uh, gives you an insight into all the work going in the TC39, including upcoming meetings, um, the old meeting notes, specifications, current spec, active proposals, how do you contribute to that stuff and so on and so forth. So I think it's, you know, since the TC39 is a very complex body and it includes a lot of companies, a lot of people, it even for people who are familiar with it and who try to track the proposals like I do, for example, it's actually really hard to figure out what the hell is going on there. I still like, I have a rough understanding of how they work because I was a member of um, a couple of W3C working groups. But it is still, you know, it's it's on a different scale. So I like it's it's always hard to figure out what is going on. And this 
tiny website does give you actually a pretty good insight into what is happening there. So if you're interested, do have a look. Right, continuing, we got uh, some pretty exciting news about the workers. So I think last podcast I was saying that there was work on workers within the Node.js, which is essentially a Node.js threads, right? And uh, yeah, that was 19 days ago, I think maybe one or two podcasts ago. And uh, now we actually have worker merged into master. So um, if we are lucky, we I'm not like I'm not con- like I'm not hundred percent sure, but if we are lucky and if everything goes as planned, we are gonna see it in the next node release, probably 10.5 or something, right? Maybe it's gonna be pushed to the next major. I don't know how exactly they are planning to release that, but um, nonetheless, this is something really, really cool and exciting. All right. Continuing, we got intent to implement WebGPU. So apparently WebGPU is the thing. I did not know that this was um, a spec that was basically was worked on, I believe, or maybe I just forgot about it, but it's really cool because uh, essentially it's gonna be a GPU API that's gonna be accessible from web, right? So it's a successor to WebGL as you can see here. And it's gonna be way more low level as far as I understand it. So it's gonna allow doing things like running TensorFlow on GPU in the web, which can be incredibly, um, how do you put it? Which can give an incredible boost to machine learning specifically in the browser, right? So because they, like a lot of the modern machine learning approaches, they are quite heavily utilized the GPUs. And currently the only way to do that from the web is using WebGL, which is, I mean, it's okay, but there's a lot of things you cannot do with it. So WebGL, uh, WebGPU aims to tackle that. So um, the Chrome seems to be the first ones who are uh, intending to implement it. And we're gonna see how that develops and we're gonna see where will that lead. One of the other interesting areas, of course, is gaming. So it's gonna be very interesting to see if the We're gonna get like Unity games or maybe Unreal Engine games compiled to the web, which would be pretty cool. I mean, they did try already doing that with uh, WebAssembly and ASM.js before that, right? So it seems to be working relatively well, although a bit uh, obviously slower than the natively. It's gonna be like exciting times in front of us. We're gonna see how that ends up. Okay, continuing, we got another small feature, which is pretty neat coming to Jest. I thought I would highlight that. Uh, Jest is gonna have to throw error matching inline snapshots. So it's essentially a snapshots for errors. And no longer you have to basically match the strings yourself. You can just say, hey, error should match the snapshot and bang, it works. Which, I mean, I just, (laughs) I don't know about you, but I absolutely love snapshots and they make your life 10 times uh, easier. Uh, TensorFlow, yes, te- I know that TensorFlow already uses WebGL, but as I said, WebGL, uh, as far as I know, does not provide you, you know, low level enough access to GPU to utilize uh, as much API as you do in the normal TensorFlow, for example, from Python, right? So it definitely is going to be uh, an improvement over WebGL. That's what I'm saying. Um, right, uh, continuing, we got, oh yeah, uh, speaking about GitHub acquisition, GitLab saw a huge spike in users migrating from GitHub to GitLab because they were scared of something, I don't know. Uh, But the cool thing is that GitLab said that the ultimate and gold editions of the subscription, so if you didn't know, they have like this um, ultimate and gold, which I don't even remember if gold is, I think gold is the one for the, yeah, GitLab.com, right. So gold is the GitLab.com one and the ultimate is the self-hosted ones. So you can actually get those for free now if you are in education. So if you're a university school or teacher or whatever, you can just request it and they will give it to you. And if you are open source project. So if you're hosted on GitHub, you can apply for gold edition, which actually gives you a ton of really cool things. Like for example, 50,000 CI pipeline minutes per month, which is a lot of builds, including uh, all the features like yeah, epics, roadmaps, uh, dependency scanning, container scanning, Kubernetes cluster monitoring, chat ops, and there's like billion of different features that are really, really cool. And uh, yeah, I mean, this like basically those all of those features are included into the gold edition. So if you need a very complex infrastructure from for your project, then uh, GitLab actually just became very, very compelling. 
like it's not given away just because you are there and because you're open source, you do have to apply for it, but the application process is quite simple, right? So you, first of all, you have to use the OC approved license. You cannot make any money from your project. Uh, so it has to be nonprofit. And then you just um, a merge request, send a merge request to a list of open source projects using GitLab Gold, and that's it, you're done. Um, it's really awesome that they are doing this. And uh, I wonder how the whole, you know, GitLab GitHub war will unfold once the Microsoft finishes the acquisition and uh, start working on a GitHub. Because let's be frank, GitHub was stagnating for quite some time, right? They haven't really added any new major features in years, basically. So we're, we're gonna see how that goes. But nonetheless, it's a, whoops, it's a pretty cool uh, offer. All right, and last thing I have in the um, article section is actually a video. Um, apologies, they started playing right away. So last time I showed you the Deno project, the new um, reimagining of Node.js uh, as a TypeScript runtime on V8 from the uh, Ron Dahl, the guy who originally wrote Node.js, right? Uh, and there's a talk from the GSConf EU that's called 10 things I regret about Node.js. Um, and essentially he goes into the, you know, explaining what he did wrong about Node.js, what he regrets doing about Node.js, specifically NPM packages and all that kind of stuff, which is quite interesting to hear actually, and how he tackles it with Deno. So if you want to know more about Deno, if you, why was it made, how is it different? Then this is definitely a good talk. It's quite interesting. And I mean, it's just like 25 minutes. So, you know, not too much time. Right. Uh, now we're going to go to the releases section. Let me have a look at the chats. Uh, Bitbucket is not mentioned much. I mean, Bitbucket is nice. I used to use it quite a lot, but I think GitLab offers way more essentially for way less. So even the free tier of GitLab is better, I think. I mean, it's like Bitbucket works a bit better in terms of speed. GitHub is a bit slow, uh, but the feature wise, I think they are losing quite significantly unless, I mean, I haven't checked it for like last year, maybe they've changed now, but uh, it's like they don't really offer anything uh, significant over GitLab, right? Uh, aside maybe from Jira integration, but I personally loathe Jira. So, you know, nah, 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 nah. All right, let's get to the releases section. Um, so first big release of the week is uh, VS Code version 124 as usual. Very, very, very big release list. And there is, I think among the highlights is uh, unused variable detection. So it actually will now uh, show you the variables that you haven't used, where is it? Come on, uh, it was somewhere here. Yeah, there you go. So it actually, when you import stuff that you don't use or when you declare the variables that are not used, even if you don't have ESLint or other linter enabled, the VS Code itself will just show you them in a gray color that, hey, they are actually not used. Maybe you don't, you don't need them. And you have a delete all and use declarations uh, thing that will automatically clean this up. So actually, I have that uh, enabled by default now. And whenever I save the file, it just removes them automatically, which can be quite useful. Um, there's a move to new file refactoring that is probably uh, familiar to all the people who use a full-fledged IDE like uh, Visual Studio, for example. I personally never used it, I think, or haven't used it until now. Maybe I will, I don't know. Uh, there's now a really cool feature, auto date of imports on file moving. So we know whenever you rename or move a file, VS Code will ask you if you want to auto fix all the path imports and so on and so forth. And it will actually do that for you, which is absolutely insane. It's, it's awesome. Like I just absolutely love the features that the VS Code guys are allowed in literally every, every, every release they do. And yeah, the, um, another like cool highlight is the VS Code, uh, the IntelliSense for predefined variables that you can basically, uh, Yes, it suggests predefined variables. That's basically all it does, which is quite great for some, some of the files, right? Like tasks or uh, launch.json configurations. There's obviously TypeScript 2.9, which was recently released along with a ton of other features. So if you are interested to have a look, there's like, it's too long. I won't go through all of that. 
Right, next release we got is Note 10.4. Um, again, minor release with uh, update of V8 to 6.7. And a uh, stream pipeline that will rethrow errors without callback now. There's a bunch of other obviously things that as usual, but it's again minor release, so not much changes here. Continuing, we got a React Hot Loader version 4.3 with the major highlight being Preact support and Cold Component support. Um, it's really cool to see Preact being added natively to a lot of tooling that was originally built for React. I mean, I do like Preact and I think all my React projects end up being released with a Preact swapped uh, or React swapped for Preact because, I mean, come on, you like it's it's compatible and it takes like 10 times less space so why would you not do that um all right continuing we got react native web version 0 0.8 uh, if you haven't seen this project yet it is actually fascinating and it allows you to compile react native for web without any changes and they've yeah they've there's like a bunch of new features so they now support additional things within the uh, images and swipeable flat lists. And you know, it's, it's insane how fast the project develops. It would be very interesting to see if it, when it hits version 1.0, we would actually be able to take our React Native projects and just compile them for the web and release them. That would be freaking amazing. I mean, it has all the potential to essentially tackle that. Uh, and yeah, you can see the comprehensive list of what it supports and what it not supports yet. So yeah, it's a pretty cool one to track. All right, continuing, we got PNPM version two. So uh, if you're not familiar, PNPM is an alternative to NPM and it uh, aims to be a faster and disk space efficient uh, version of NPM essentially. It is compatible with NPM. And uh, it, yeah, so one of the things is deterministic log file. I think that is no longer sort of advantage over NPM, right? Because NPM now has deterministic log files as well. And uh, other than that, actually, I've, I haven't tracked it for quite some time. So um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. So I guess the disk efficiency is now the main advantage over the other stuff, right? So we're gonna see, I should probably investigate a bit more about this. I didn't, unfortunately did not have enough time to check it out, but it's always good to have alternatives, right? So let's, let's just leave it at that. All right, next thing we got is Good Share version 5.0, which um, got bees in my room now. Great. <laughs> All right, uh, yes, Goodreads, uh, GoodShareJS.5.0, which is, um, it used to be a jQuery plugin for sharing links. Right now it's actually a ES6, like a modern JavaScript solution for sharing links in social media. Like uh, if you just go here and uh, we got 5.0 and I think something is blocked here, which is a bit weird. There we go. Usage, is there a demo somewhere? Because I remember I saw a really cool demo share link. Um, no, no demos really, okay. But basically, yeah, it's it's a very simple way of adding a share button to your website. Um, quite small and quite efficient and does not require jQuery any longer. So, you know, if you're looking for a neat share button, then do have a look at this. And it supports like a billion of different services uh, for sharing. All right, we got the next release, Puppeteer version 1.5 um, with Chromium 69 being the major, I guess, highlight here. Uh, the other cool things include you can now use workers class to interact with web workers, which is pretty insane if you think about it. You now have browser context where you can use to isolate the cookies and other data shared between the pages, which is also really neat. So you don't longer have to create user profiles and you know do this uh, all like separate user folders user profiles that I for example I used to do to sort of uh, distinguish between the, the entities right so you can actually have the browser context right now and uh, yeah it's like puppeteer keeps getting better and better basically all right next thing we got is meteor 1.7 so apparently meteor is still a thing still alive still kicking <coughs> apologies still um getting better i've never used it so i'm not a huge fan of um, like large all-in-one frameworks i find them to be slightly limiting especially when you need to do a very specific things but uh, again that's my thing my problem 
I know that there are people out there who like them and who use them extensively. So if you are one of them, do have a look. Seems like they've improved just about anything you can imagine about it, including the bundle sizes and loading speed. And um, yeah, seems to be quite good. So do have a look at it if you are looking for an all-in-one framework. All right, uh, yes, we got Safari 12 and a bunch of other things from the Apple Developer Conference last week, right? Safari 12 comes with uh, some pretty cool things like uh, 3D AR and uh, Model Viewer. And uh, in addition, you now have to, um, you now have an ability to render HTML on Apple Watch and WatchOS. So you can actually, people now will be able to navigate the web pages from the watch directly. I already saw some salty people uh, on Twitter who was like, oh, now I have to make sure my pages render properly on watch. <laughs> which I mean, which I guess is a valid concern, right? So you can now be, uh, never be sure that your page will not be watched from the watch. So having responsive design is all the more important. But uh, pretty cool to see uh, with all the stuff. There's some interesting things with uh, privacy actually. So they have this intelligent tracking prevention which will essentially combat the advertisement uh, from tracking you, right? So you no longer, I think there will be like 30 days timeout and your tracking stuff will be basically purged and uh, the advertisers won't be able to track you more than 30 days, which is pretty cool. And I'm really waiting for Chrome to follow this up and do at least something similar. Although, you know, I'm not sure they will because Google and Google are kind of, their business is based on ads. So I'm not sure if they want to do something like this. But anyway, cool to see that uh, someone's trying to do something about that um, in core of the browsers, not through the plugins. Although, you know, the plugins works fine. But yeah. Right, continuing, we got, um, oh yeah, I think that's that's it for releases. So now we get to the new libraries and demos section. Um, there is a bunch of things. So let's start with, a, this is a press release. So this is actually not the release itself yet. They are promising to release it quite soon. So the German company Neonius GmbH is going to release a low JS, no JS fork made specifically for embedded devices. Like if you're working in the embedded devices field, you know that you know, you're know you typically very resource constrained in there and running a normal node generally doesn't work that well. And um, those guys claim that they've made a fork that makes it possible to run it on a $3 low powered microcontroller, which is quite insane. If you never work with embedded devices, there is existing Node.js forks like from a Samsung, for example, that aimed at a IoT and embedded devices. And they like, they are obviously way more efficient than the Node.js itself in terms of memory and you know resource usage. But I don't think I've ever heard of a Node fork that would run on a $3 microcontroller. That would be very interesting to have a look and see how that ends up being. So they are saying they're gonna release it with a source under MIT by the end of July, uh, hopefully. So we're gonna see how that goes. But it is really interesting, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, really curious about this project. So let's see how that develops. Okay, next thing we got is, let me just pause that real quick. Apple introduced MapKit.js. So if you ever wanted to include Apple Maps into your JavaScript app, well, now you can. I've uh, you know, I still remember all those terrible memes and terrible examples of Apple Maps being absolutely abysmal from the time when they released it. I haven't used it since. So I don't know, like I, I really like Google Maps and uh, I don't know how they compare right now. So they're probably way better. At least that's what I heard, but they do look nice, I guess. I don't know what kind of features they have, but uh, it's pretty cool that they released the JavaScript library for it. So it's like, it's something I did not actually expect from Apple since, you know, they kind of combat the uh, JavaScript world as much as they can to push their app store and everything because they don't want progressive app apps on mobile devices, at least. It's like, I think Safari is literally the only browser that lags behind in progressive app app support on mobiles, which is... Yeah. A bit sad, but you know, let's see how that goes. All right, continuing, we got email, uh, blah, let's try that again. We got ml5.js, uh, it's a friendly machine learning for the web, which seems to have a very nice API. Um, yeah, you can literally do that. You know, you can get a prediction from a mobile net image classifier in two lines of code, which is 
kind of incredible when you think about it. Um, it seems to include already pre pre-trained data sets, right? So you can have uh, you have like image classifier, KNN classifier, LSTM, style transfer, word to vec, and all that stuff. In JavaScript, again, this is worth noting. I haven't checked it out myself yet, but I am curious if that also works in the browser. Um, if it does, then it's going to be mind blowing. Uh, if it's not, then you know, having that in Node.js is also kind of incredible. So yeah, if you're interested in machine learning, it does seem to work in browser. Holy shit. Okay, that is that is really impressive. Gonna have to check that out a bit closer. <laughs> Um, and I have to start it, by the way, because that looks absolutely incredible. Right, continuing, we got Node Purge, a fast and flexible JSON logger. So it's, uh, yeah, JSON logger for uh, modern Node.js. They claim it's fast, it seems to be relatively small, but there is no uh, benchmarks to back the speed aspect. So, you know, if you, if you claim on GitHub that you are fast, please, please provide... Oh, there are benchmarks. They are just not referenced in the... Um, in the readme and there's no results unless you run them which is a bit sad i guess but yeah is there wait a second is there actually been, maybe i'm just blind and not you now there's no okay so the, there's no results anywhere but yeah it's nice they have benchmarks but i don't want to run them myself so um, it will be nice to include the results in the readme but yeah if you're looking for another json logger then this might be your gem just have a look okay continuing we got pull to refresh js uh, exactly what you would expect it's a tiny script that adds a pull to refresh to page. Uh, although, you know, quite a lot of uh, mobile browsers actually do that by default now. Not sure how useful it is unless you are running a progressive web app, right? Uh, seems to be quite minimalistic and uh, working pretty well. So, yeah. Right, continuing, we got React Ape. Now, this is a crazy project. So, this is, uh, it's still work in progress. It's sort of experimental, but it's a React renderer that allows you to build... UIs using Canvas and WebGL. Why this is important is essentially because you can build fancy UIs for things like TVs, PS4, Nintendo Switch, Vita, PS3, and other low memory devices, right? Because you use WebGL and Canvas, which doesn't actually require a lot of memory. So you can just re-render the whole thing. Um, like it's, <laughs> every time I see project like this, it just blows my mind how like what kind of crazy things you can actually do with the web. And uh, it's it, it gives you a pretty simple React API and then renders it to WebGL and Canvas. So if you are working with the projects that require you to work in a memory constrained environments, then do have a look at this. Obviously it isn't, as I said, is not ready yet. It's not finished, but it doesn't stop you from playing with it, right? So do have a look at that. Okay, continuing, we got Blast.js. Uh, it is a pure JavaScript, manually written, as it says, implementation of Blast. Uh, so it's, um, was it the basic, yeah, basic linear algebra, algebra programs. If you ever worked with NumPy, MATLAB, Mathematica, or whatever, or Octave, you know what it is. Uh, if you ever needed to work with Blast, you know what it is. If you never needed to work with it, you probably will never uh, need it either unless you you know switch areas and start working with uh, some linear al algebra stuff but it's really cool to see a library like this in javascript so it seems to be working both in browser and node.js uh, i'm curious if it already added support for big int um, it also exposes like float 64 32 arrays there's a lot of really interesting things here so yeah if you are looking to work with uh, linear algebra stuff um, in node.js then do have a look the read me for this thing is humongous all right continuing we got ram react application manager um, exp um not express getting what am i saying electron js app that allows you to quickly create and develop react apps so if you are not a fan of command lines uh, if you prefer uis or if you just want to do this quickly then this is basically a project for you it does all the create react app scaffolding and everything for you and just opens an editor and debugging for you. You know, you have also the server management and everything, hot loading with basically everything included, right? Also works with Vue.js, it seems, Preact, Razzle and all the other types. So it's not simply React uh, based. Right, continuing, we got Vue Sacks, a very fancy Vue components framework um, 
It has a very nice logo and in general, very nice uh, set of components. Where is my documentation? There we go. The components are super fancy looking. And uh, I mean, you know, Vue.js is a pretty nice framework. So if you never worked with it, do give it a shot. I mean, it is not React. I would say it's maybe simpler than React to learn because it's closer to the your typical templating uh, languages, right? And in some cases, like I do use Vue for simple demos because it simply doesn't require to set up any pre-compilation, for example. You can just throw in a Vue.js into the HTML file and will work. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it seems to have an insane amount of components and all of them look incredibly fancy. So if you are looking for something like this, do have a look. It's like avatar, card, tab, switch. There's a ton of things here and even a grid layout. So yeah, that's a really cool one. Okay, continuing, we got primitive. Uh, it's a Node.js uh, library that reproduces images from geometric uh, primitives, right? So quite simple. You throw in an image and you get something like this as a result. Um, and you can even get uh, GIF demonstrations, I believe, if you want to, uh, you know, do things like this. So you can generate cats from ellipses because why not? It's always good. Pretty. I mean, I think the most interesting part is reading the code of this. It's pretty cool to see how you can do something like this yourself. I mean, it's not incredibly large. So yeah. All right, next thing we got is react ideal image an almost ideal react image component. And uh, I was like, yeah, so why do you need a react image component? It was, you know, you can just use an image tag. And then I started reading about the features that it has. And I was like, Oh, yeah, you do need all of those things typically, right? So there is like when you think, um, when you think about showing images, you think, okay, that's really easy. I just render it, right? But actually, it's way more complex, uh, like way more complicated than this, because you need like lazy loading, you need placeholders, you need low quality um, placeholders, maybe, right? You need responsiveness, you need adaptiveness, you need a slow network loading, and so on and so forth. And this image component handles all of that which is kind of crazy, but on the other hand, really cool. So if you have a website that works a lot with images, do have a look at this. It's a pretty cool solution. Next thing we got is hyper. I guess this is how you read it, hyper, or maybe heaper, hyper. I'm, let's call it hyper. A statistical analysis tool for performance testing is a command line tool that um, allows you to uh, profile the requests to the websites to see when exactly the time is spent. And it gives you the whole like, you know, lookup time, TCP connect, downloading, DOM render, widescreen, DOM ready. So it's sort of a command line version of the, man, I forgot the name of it. What was the name of it? Light, um, what is the name of it? Light, oh, come on. Lighthouse, of course, Lighthouse. This is what I want to say. <laughs> So this is a command line uh, version of Lighthouse, essentially lightweight Lighthouse. And seems like also supports like, you know, uh, multiple requests to get a better statistics and so on and so forth. So if you are into the performance tuning, then do we have a look at that? Okay, next thing we got is Lumen.js, a JavaScript library for progressively highlighting any text on a page. This is exactly the example you see. So it's a nice, gives you a nice animation and uh, I'm not sure why would I want to use that, but you know, I guess I just don't work in the area that actually requires that. Uh, maybe nice for some, oh, you can actually use it for typing effect. <laughs> that's actually pretty neat. That's true. Okay. But yeah, you know, it seems to be like a nice tiny library, just one kilobyte uh, gzipped without any dependencies. So if you need something like this, do have a look. Right. Next thing we got is JS UI, a powerful UI toolkit for managing JavaScript apps. Uh, so it is once again, sort of a electron based dashboard for uh, managing your project, your package JSON, I guess, and everything else, right? So you can generate apps, you can uh, figure out what ports are open and so on and so forth seems to be quite feature packed. And they've been releasing versions like crazy in the past, like since announcement, they announced it like a couple of days ago and there's already 12 version released as I or two hours ago. <laughs> so it seems to be in the pretty active developments. Uh, yeah, if you're again, if you're not a fan of command lines and want some sort of a more visual UI to have a look, um, does provide quite a lot of features. 
Right, next thing we got is a plugin for VS Code from one of the viewers called Surround. And uh, it's a pretty straightforward run. So whenever you want to wrap something in uh, if else, try catch or other blocks like for and so on and so forth, including custom blocks that you can uh, define yourself, you can just do it with uh, VS Code's command plaid. So I personally am not a target audience of a plugin like this because I like as you might have noticed from my development streams i rarely use any refactoring capabilities of my um id of editor i don't know why i just never get used to that it's just i like i try to write as little code as possible so for my opinion it's always easier to write it yourself but you know if you're doing a lot of refactoring yourself then this seems to be a pretty handy thing yeah all right continuing we got keyframes.app a really really neat app uh, that or web app, I guess, that allows you to create CSS animation. It also includes the Chrome extension, and uh, it is kind of crazy. So it's a keyframe based, as you might imagine, right? And uh, it is very easy to um, wait. Wait a second. Why? Why you know? I want that to be zero, and this is literally all you have to do, right? So here, I made an animation. <laughs> It is really cool. And then you just, you know, get the CSS, paste it in your page and it works. It is just incredibly cool. Like this is really, really solid app. All right, next thing we got is Katana CSS, CSS um, sharp CSS layout system made with Flexbox. So if you needed a simple Flexbox layout system, then do have a look at this. Uh, it seems to be based on uh, SAS, uh, also available as CSS, obviously. I personally prefer to write my own Flexbox because I mean, come on, let's be frank, Flexbox is not complex, so it's not that hard to make it yourself. But you know, if you're looking for a slightly simpler layout system, then have a look at this. All right, and the last thing I wanna show off, this is definitely not a new one, but I thought that maybe some of the viewers did not know about it. Um, it's a web frameworks benchmark uh, collection and they do it every half a year or so, sometimes more frequently. It's essentially um, a collection of benchmarks that, uh, well, as you might guess, benchmark the different web frameworks with a very, very comprehensive list of those frameworks and uh, very comprehensive results. So the interesting thing here is that they not just benchmark it on Hello World or whatever, but they actually benchmark it for specific tasks like JSON serialization or single query to the database, multiple queries to the database, or fortunes generation, or data updates, or plain text request, right? And you can also pick, this is something new that I haven't seen before, you can also pick between the physical and cloud hardware, which is uh, pretty neat. The cool thing is that you can also, um, ooh, I think I've overloaded a bit, let me just refresh it real quick. Uh, the cool thing is that you can also uh, filter by a bunch of different things. So you can like disable everything, right? And you can say, okay, so I want to have, um, I want to have Node.js frameworks, right? With JavaScript, Golang, and uh, doesn't matter for this. And I want to compare it with uh, Nginx in the front end and MongoDB and MySQL in the back end. And then you get the results for that. And then you can see um, apply changes. I wonder if anything will show. And okay, I probably did not select enough stuff, but basically you can pretty, um, you can select the facets pretty, um, how do you put it correctly? Pretty fine grained, right? To figure out which language and which framework would work best for your specific use case, which is pretty neat. And again, you know, the fact that they don't really do this on just Hello World, but actually specialize in uh, different tasks is really awesome. Let me just clear out all the tasks. There you go. So if you are looking to compare for the best um, framework to do your you know, single query or multi query requests, then do have a look at this. This has quite comprehensive uh, results. And yeah, as you can see here, Java, for example, with Postgres wins in pretty much both uh, database queries. As, as you would imagine, I mean, as much as people hate Java, it is a really performant language if you write it correctly. I believe the source code for all of this is also available. So yeah, it's a really cool resource for performance. All right, we are done with the demos. Now let's talk about silly things. The first silly thing I have is this 
joke by Randy Olson, the author of D3JS. Uh, I'm not sure if that Microsoft tweet is um, like joke or not, if it's if it's even if it's photoshopped or if it was real. But yeah, I was like, it's essentially now pronounced GitHub, uh, which is uh, obviously a joke reference to GIF and GIF thing and uh, time to riot. Yes, this is the worst side of the acquisition of GitHub, obviously. <laughs> and um, what do you want from me, Twitter? Yeah, the last thing I wanted to talk about is, I mean, it's on a silly side as well, but it's also like sort of looking back 10 years ago, uh, we had jQuery battling Dodger UI and MooTools for dominance and MooTools is still looming shadow over the modern ES6 standards, as you know. Uh, Node.js wasn't even a thing. I mean, and Firebug was the only real developer tool. Um, if you compare the Firebug to the modern Google Dev tools, then man, we did come a long way. Chrome wasn't even released, it wasn't even existing yet, and nobody took JavaScript dev seriously. JavaScript was a toy language, right? So everyone think. And in 10 years, we have JavaScript being the top one language in the world right now. There is um, so much awesome things with it. And yeah, it is, it is kind of incredible how much changed in 10 years, right? So here's, here we go. I'm really excited to see how the JavaScript will change in the next 10 years with WebAssembly and all that kind of stuff, gaining the traction and, you know, gaining more, more and more tools. Right. That's basically all I have for today. Thank you guys for watching. Um, if you have any questions, do post them into Twitch chat. If you are watching this on YouTube, feel free to post the questions into the comment section. If you have any news that you think I might have missed this week, throw them into Twitch chat or into the YouTube. I will cover them next week if you are doing this on YouTube, obviously. If you have any links in general, feel free to throw them into the issues on GitHub or into our Discord server or me personally to me on Twitter, Twitch, whatever you can basically way contact me. Feel free to join our Discord server. I'm always happy to talk to you and help you with your JavaScript endeavors. Um, there's also a lot of other people who are quite proficient in JavaScript and can help you with your problems. We are always um, happy to teach people there basically. Um, that's, yeah, that's basically all I have for today. Doesn't seem like chat has any other questions, suggestions, or articles. So um, thank you guys for watching. Uh, again, apologies for skipping the yesterday. My migraine was too bad to even uh, sit, basically. So I had to lie down for the whole, whole day, which was kind of annoying, but yeah, kind of used to this stuff. Uh, but yeah, let's end this on a good note. So... Thank you for watching. This was episode 14 of the XGS Weekly and I see you next week. Bye.